And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the upcoming campaign setting for 5th edition known as Fading Emperors, A Frozen Age, the one, the one and only John Yackel. How you doing today, man? Hi, feeling feeling good. Glad to be here. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Um, is it Yackel or Yakel? Us uh, Yakel. All right. I'm used to it. <laughs> oh, I've had people screw up my name, so I try not to follow suit. <laughs> Fair enough. So. One tradition that I, t that I tend to have here in the temple is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Oh, um, it was a babysitter uh, when I was in first grade. <laughs> My brother was in fifth grade, and uh, yeah... <laughs> so, so just like I, I don't even know what edition of D and D it, it was if if AD and D was out or second edition or, or or if it was just still the original at that point. Um, but yeah, my first character was a a human fighter named Blaster, which didn't make a lot of sense. But I was six years old at the time, <laughs> um, and so that was my first real that was my first exposure exposure to it. Um, but I always liked fantasy movies, and like there were, there weren't a whole lot of fantasy movies for me growing up. Like like probably Willow was like the biggest fantasy movie of my childhood, outside like Dark Crystal and Labyrinth sort of mm -hmm. things. And so I came back to it, and uh, I came back around to D and D in middle school, um, and just I, I I was the I was the one who was more interested in making in creating the stories, um, and so I just sort of just sort of really easily sunk into the role of dungeon master and uh stayed there ever since so from about 13 to i'm 41 now mm -hmm. uh i'm i am a forever gm uh and i love it that way like i just i, I need the stories more than a lot of my friends do and and i have no problem putting in the like a ridiculous number of hours uh preparing and just really creating a, a full, a full experience, a full detailed world. Mm -hmm. Big adherent of like the uh, for for campaigns at least of like the, the like a sandbox style thing where like things are happening everywhere and not necessarily just uh, just w just where the players are and what they see. Mm -hmm. Um. No, I could be a I could be a smartass and, and say so. You like the power trip? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's yeah, it's not actually just about the power trip. It's just the, it's like the need to the need to create and and just the, the need to get it get it out of my head, get it into a form that I can share with my friends. Yeah, and when it when with that, with that kind of thing in mind, where did was Fading Embers a campaign setting that you had already done within your within your group for a long time, and that and now you're bringing um, to everybody, or was this one that you created in more recent times? Uh, it's much more recent. Um, back in 2014, um, I got married and moved from New Jersey out to Cleveland. Um, so most of my friends are still they're in the like the New York tri-state area, mm -hmm. or they're in like near Bal around Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and it, Fading Embers, the world of NIF was like it was an old project from middle school or high school that was always like kind of a back burner. Um, and right around the time of the move, uh, you know, all my stuff was packed up, and for some reason, I sort of dug out whatever notes I still had about it and thought like well, well let me take a crack at designing this as an adult now um and, and it was definitely inspired by the old tsr dark sun setting you know just like dark sun was so different from 
every other setting TSR had then um, mm-hmm. that it was it was so interesting and I thought well just as sort of like a mental exercise almost like how would I design as an adult like a snow and ice dark sun um, but then not too long after moving to Cleveland uh, I was still working on it fifth edition came out um, and somebody told me about sites like Roll20. Um, so suddenly it was possible for me to keep running games uh, because people had said that they would, but then they didn't. And so like I moved away and everyone's gaming stopped. Um, so I thought, all right, like it's a new edition. It's a new, uh, a new medium of how we're going to be playing it. Like how about we just do a whole new world as well, like that nobody mm-hmm. is used to. Um, yeah, and so I, I'm, I, I'm, I mean, I'm always comfortable creating settings, um, but but I definitely started creating more rules than than usual because I wanted I wanted sorcerers to have a big role um, in it, and I didn't really care for the sorcerers that were in the players' handbook, so I started creating my own for for, for players to choose from, mm-hmm. uh, and then it just sort of it just sort of grew out of there. Uh, whenever I had an idea, I'd I'd figure it I'd, I'd tinker with it un- until it was there and uh one of my players uh kelsey werner is an artist um and so once we once there was an open gaming license for fifth edition uh we decided to start to to start maybe maybe developing uh Nith and fading embers into into something that that we could we could like publish under the open gaming license mm-hmm. um and she got she got exhaustion like from like from from think various things in her life and the and the workload of being the only artist on a on a two person team as well, um, and she wanted me to go forward with it, and so I realized that uh, basically that I would have to use crowdfunding like Kickstarter and use that to raise money to pay the artists uh, because you just can't have a great role playing book without great art, like you mm-hmm. just. You just need the art to to breathe, to bring that world in to bring the world to life to to breathe life into it. Um, yeah, and so I got a, uh, I was I was sort of starting to look into how to do that when the pandemic hit. I've been in quarantine since the middle of March, uh, so I'm on my my second my second Kickstarter of quarantine, <laughs> and it's uh it's large, and I hope that I don't have to do another one quite this large <laughs> again. It's very intimidating, yeah. but, uh, but at last count, we're 56% up to mm-hmm. our goal and we're not quite 50% through the month. So fingers crossed, it seems to be working pretty well. Mm-hmm. So now when it, now fading embers is inten- is intended to be AM. It's in, it's it's ended it's intended to be obviously a, obviously a very wintry area, um, mm-hmm. a place where a place where positive degrees would be considered summertime. Um, now, in most of the setting, yeah, yeah. So before we before we delve before we delve deep into the the setting, could you, for the benefit of the audience, give the cliff notes of the fading embers? Um. So it would begin as just a very stereotypical fantasy world um, that is hit very suddenly uh, by an unnatural ice age. So in the middle of summer, it just becomes winter, and then it's a harsh winter, and it gets worse and worse. Um, And for nine years, it gets worse, and civilizations all over the world are dying. Species go extinct. uh, Life and civilizations just have to migrate towards the equator to stay alive. Mm-hmm. And in the area where the, where, where the setting is based, um, the, uh, a, a large empire sort of re reshapes itself down there and, uh, temperatures stabilize after nine years and life goes on for a couple of centuries. Civiliza- societies and civilizations are changing. Um, and then, and then about four centuries later, uh, there's a second drop, but instead of over time, it happens very, uh, very, very quickly, just in one day. Uh, and that empire just completely shatters under all of the 
internal and external pressures uh, with that. And so about 500 plus years after that is where the setting uh, begins. Um, and so there's there's only one kingdom left in the world. They just happen to have the very best lo- land all on the mm-hmm. equator. And everything outside of that, it there are is city states uh, separated by long stretches of of wilderness and lawlessness and wilds, uh, and that's sort of that's the setup to the to the world. And nobody and, and people have many many theories about why the Great Frost happened and 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 who was responsible. Yeah, uh, but but it's, that's all in the Game Master's manual. <laughs> It's it, it's interesting that you um, that you cited Dark Sun earlier as an inspiration when um, something like, with something like Fading Embers it's it's not it's teased um, what exactly caused it whereas with um, with dark with Dark Sun it's um a, it's a little less ambiguous about what caused that world to um be, to be in the state that it's in. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. De- like Defiler Magic. Yeah, Defiler Magic, and of course the Sorcerer Kings. Um, yep. So, would it be fair of me to say that Fading Embers leans a little bit more into the low magic end of things? Um, only in it in in some area in a lot of areas, yes. Basically, it's further away from the equator. Uh, definitely. Um, more towards the equator, there's like a, there's a set of the, there's the Kingdom of Solus and a couple of other city states that are all sort of descended from that from that empire that that broke, and those those societies have fairly high magic um, in them because uh, the upper class of their the, the, the upper class of their society the nobles. Uh, they they sl- they interbred with sorcerers uh, because wizards have to be taught, but sorcerers are just born. Um, and so over over the centuries, it sort of became one and the same that like m- noble houses have are all based around sorceress bloodlines uh, because there is no more because d- divine magic is a little less reliable and divine fire magic is extremely rare. Um, but arcane magic, like from sorcerers, uh, is is not has has not changed at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so having like having the upper cl- the upper caste of society be be born magic users, uh, it just I just sort of started coming up with different ways to uh, to show uh, you know h- how how they would use that and how that would affect how that would affect societies. Yeah. So yeah. So so yeah. In the so, so the kingdom of Solus is is fairly high magic, but then you go go too far outside of that on the map, and and the the amount of magic will drop off uh, precipitously. Mm-hmm. And even the in the magical the magic items uh, section, uh, there's even little uh, there's an asterisk that uh, that I'll put by items and that to indicate that their rarity. Like that's only their rarity when you're in those core lands, and outside of the core lands, it would be one or two steps, uh, you know, harder to find, become rare, very rare. And when it comes to when it comes to the um, ki- when it comes to the king the kingdom and the city states, would it be fair of me to say that um, sit that city states are in or or their or their equivalent are more the norm than the exception. Yes, definitely. Um. Yep. Most most civilizations are just sort of a a po- just sort of have like a pocket of influence. You know, it, whether it's a whether it's a, a neutral town or whether it's a city state, just how powerful they they are sort of determines that that aura of of influence. Um, but it but. Yeah, the the Kingdom of Solus is very much uh, the the outlier. Mm-hmm. And with that, with now um, earlier, you mentioned that you didn't care for how sorcerers were presented in um, in Core Five E. Um, what was it about? 
because sorcerers end up being a very a very a very popular class and i'm curious what your issue was with them oh it was just that the only the only the only baseline choices for them were to be um part dragon or to to use wild magic uh and i was i was definitely hoping for something that that would feel a little less out there than wild magic um and I didn't want to base I didn't want to base the sorcerers around uh, around, around dragons, um, because in because there's only uh, there's only silver and white uh, that are that are left for the most part, mm-hmm. um, and so dragons who are different colors than that are like oh that's an old wives' tale. They're, how would a dragon be red? Dragon evil dragons are white. Everyone knows that. Um, yeah, and I, I, I just did, I didn't want to tie the city states uh, in with dragons. I wanted to keep them a little bit more separated. Yeah, and so I just started coming up with with other ideas uh, for for sorceress bloodlines, mm-hmm. sort of functions for them to work around. Yeah. Um, taking that into account, are there in, when it comes to the base classes? Um, mm-hmm. Are there any that you can think of, or, or any that you can think of that I'm not going to say are, are incompatible, but might be a little bit trickier to justify within um, Fading Embers' setting? Um, you know, I don't. I don't actually feel like like there's like like any of the the core the core classes don't fit in. I think they all they all definitely have their have their places. Yeah. Yeah, that that's what that's why I'd phrased it as be, as being a little because tr- one that because I, I could because given the se- given the kind of setting I could kind of see divine magic being a little bit tricky to implement. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, yeah, when 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 the world initially froze in the in the the great frost, mm-hmm. uh, all of their 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 deities just sort of disappeared. They stopped picking up the phone, um, and divine magic was lost for for a number of years. Um, and when it when it returned, uh, it's basically it's just sort of there. There is no pantheon, um, but there's still the weave of magic around the world is still very very strong, and so it's more like uh, clerics pray to sort of their own ideal that that they feel devout about like it, you know it, it could just be praying to the 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 spirit of of life and staving off uh staving off the cold to to protect everybody uh or some they could pray to their ancestors ancestor worship becomes uh one one of the one of like the easier hallmarks for divine magic uh or they just or they just sort of create their own their own god, like their own little sort of local, uh, local deities. Uh, the one, the one exception. There's an island, uh, volcano. <laughs> there's an island with a volcano that worshipped a god of fire before the Great Frost, and following the Great Frost, uh, they made up a new god mm-hmm. of fire called the World Hearth, uh, and and the World Hearth. Uh, is the only divine source of fire magic. Yeah. And so and so it's one of one of the mysteries of the, of of the the setting is how like how did the world hearth manage that and how did this how did this island state of Bakaugara uh manage to to corner the market on fire magic. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing that I'm guessing that when it comes that when it comes to when it comes to exploring outside outside of the more outside of the more comfortable equator areas mm-hmm. um do you have do you plan on an emphasis on on rules when it comes to surviving and making sure that players don't freeze um i i did develop rules for them mm-hmm. um that are in the setting primer and they'll they'll be uh They'll, they'll be somewhere in the main campaign set, probably yeah. the game master's manual. Mm-hmm. Um, 
wh while I did come up with rules for them, uh, I very rarely, I very rarely use it. Um, well, in, in 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 part because I I often run very long campaigns, um, and so my players have been sort of a significantly high a high enough level where they have magic that just sort of makes a lot of those issues unnecessary. Um, but mainly they're you they're intended for like long trips, like a, like maybe a, a, a like a, a trip of of several weeks instead of. If it's just if it's just a one week trip, a week like a trip of a few days, um, mm -hmm. they're they're a little more they're, they're more guideliney they're more guidelines than rules as well. Uh, just sort of s something something that a game master can use to to spark their own idea of of how to of how to make an encounter fit around it, and a lot of it is about. Um, yeah, it's about uh, having having supply, having f basically food versus like having equipment like that that has to stand up to to the rigors of of travel and a, a, and a heat source, of course. Yeah, and when it come when it comes to fi when it come when. It when it comes to when it comes to that, is do you see do you see that do you see um, Fading Embers as a game that could possibly support hex crawl style play? I'm not completely sure what you mean by hex crawl. Um, hex crawl hex crawl is a more hex crawl is a more sandboxy style um, where you go where you have a map that's separated into different hexes. Each of them has chances for event events to happen, encounters, so um, so on. Okay, yeah, like an overworld map. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I think it could it could definitely lend itself to that. Uh, yeah, I think that would I think that would be an interesting way to do it, for sure. Yep. And I know I m I mentioned about I mentioned about um. About classes that may, that may or may not be tr be tricky to work with. Um, when it comes to race, when it comes to races, are there are there mm -hmm. some that might be a little bit more tricky? Um, well, the trickiest ones, uh, the trickiest one was was tieflings, um, mm -hmm. and so they just don't exist on the world of Nith anymore. Um, one of the one of the one of the main things in the open gaming license, the the the, the system reference document, is like the list of the list of things that I, I can and can't mention in in something published under the open gaming li license. And so one of those things are names like Batezu and Tanari, and all of the uh, the more descriptive names for the various outer planes of the Great Wheel. Um, and much to my my friend's uh, surprise, um, the world of Nith is cut is basically cut off from the rest of the planes. It's cut off from the outer planes and the inner planes, and you pretty much can't go further uh, than than the border ethereal, um, which is which is very hard for me to write because I love Planescape is my favorite one. So my friends are very surprised that I would cut a world off off from the planes, um, but it's just for meta it's for meta plot reasons, and so. Uh, and so demons and devils haven't been able to visit the world for a very long time, so there are no more Tiflings. Uh, the forest gnome subrace went extinct, and the lightfoot halflings are not extinct, mm -hmm. but they're dying off. Like, every generation is smaller than the one before it, and there's just sort of like a little pocket of them right on the equator. Um, and, then, and then other than, other than them... Uh, Dragonborn are, are, are limited to white and silver, uh, just like as as are the dragons uh, at the moment. Uh, and then I create, and, and I just sort of created some new ones to help to help fill it to help fill in the gaps. Uh, yetis uh, replaced the the forest gnomes, uh, uh, the the barbagazi. It's like a 
don't remember if it's Nordic or, or around Switzerland. It's a folklore uh, creature mm -hmm. that was covered in white fur. And so it's, it's, a, it's a breed of gnome who have uh, long white hair, sometimes mistaken for, for fur. Uh, and they, they have extremely close relations with the fae. And so they're a little bit more whimsical and fun to play. Um, and the and the foundlings, uh, probably the most interesting race um, that I came up with, uh, who are a very late addition to the setting. Um, I can get into that now or later if you yeah if go you yeah go ahead. Um, so, so they they come they come out of what what I did with the elves. I wanted I wanted to do something something very different. I, I I'd always. I'd always thought it would be interesting to have a setting where elves were not dying out, where they weren't a fate, a race who was fading away, mm -hmm. um, like like in Tolkien and many other settings. Um, I, I wanted people to to occasionally just have, the, like, th that the mention of elves could could instead make somebody go, "Oh, oh crap, the elves are here." Um, so there's some seas in the middle. Most of the setting is on a northern continent, mm -hmm. and there's a tip of a southern continent and in, in those lands um th some elven kingdoms as they migrated north to stay alive uh the human land the humans there did not want to uh to coexist and so they and so war broke out um and there were uh, uh, a lot of a uh, lot of a lot of mixed emotions and and uh problems inherent in there um and by the end of it uh the humans were conquered uh, two separate elven city states sprung up, um, and they are and, and they have a human slave caste. Uh, one city, uh, one city's intention is to make humanity suffer for their crimes, like as long as they possibly can. And the other city uh, is more like they see themselves more as strict wardens that humans are dangerous and need to be controlled. Um, and so these southern elves are are uh, setting in, setting antagonists, and while the, and while I did make I, I created some homeland ability rules, just little little abilities um, to represent like sort of the cultures that that characters come from. And while there are homeland abilities for the southern elves, they're more they're more meant to be a place uh, where bad guys come from, uh, mm -hmm. or you know. Uh, characters who left like those evil societies behind um yeah. but in the but in the north across the seas um basically the elves moved in with the dwarves um and they set aside they set aside their long their long stereotypical history of animosity uh for eternal friendship and sharing of sharing of everything uh, basically, and over the centuries, just the the dwarven cities inside the mountains changed, bringing in elvish architecture, creating new new neighborhoods, um, for, like maybe just some for the elves, and eventually they would they would blend together. Um, and so, after nine hundred years, uh, the, they're they're called the grand cities now. Mm -hmm. And they're just sort of little, little fantasy socialist utopias, <laughs> um, who who were very isolationist for most of the timeline, and only in the last thirty years or so did they have they opened up, have they opened up their borders and really started engaging in the outside world, um, and so the foundlings that got me into this, um, I I had had I I'd, I'd had it written in. That um, that like sure, elves and dwarves can fall in love and they can get married, um, but they probably can't reproduce, so nothing ever really comes of it. Um, and so late, kind of right in the middle of actually doing this, ma making the setting primer, um, it occurred to me that I was really just missing an, an opportunity to do something really special. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can't. <laughs> and so I came up with the the idea of the foundlings uh, that they're. So they're they're half or they're half elf and half dwarf. Um, they have metallic skin, um, and are just very uh, 
very seen as very special. They're very spiritual. Um, they're they're sort of the living embodiment of of what the grand cities strive to be. That like bringing in two disparate parts to make something uh, miraculously new and interesting. Um, and so the foundlings have only existed for the last eighty years in the game. Uh, and so all. And so there's lots of things that even the Grand Cities just don't know. Nobody knows how long a foundling lives. Uh, the first foundling who's 80 years old is definitely still in the prime of her life. Uh, and a lot of their abilities are are uh, still being figured out as well. Uh, their rules aren't still being figured out. Those will all be in the player's manual. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it's, it's it's been very interesting to, to try to make them be a, a single unique thing because even having two separate sub races for them I needed to be really careful not to let one become more elfy and the other become more dwarfy yeah and I'd say I'd say there's already um, already an abundance of that there is <laughs> uh, yeah you gotta give them a little bit a little bit from everything. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Um. Now when now when it com now when it comes to I know there I know that there was a few there have been a few examples um brought in but when it com when it comes to so when it comes to subclasses what are what are a few new things that are being brought that are being brought to the table and. Is the is the first part of the question? The second part is, given how given how Matt, given how um, the world has changed so much, um, how does this how does this affect say magic and how magic is used? All right. Um, okay. So so magic. Um, well, divine magic certainly. Uh, changed the most with with fire magic being being rare only the world hearth uh, being able to grant it um, for players uh, it it almost gives them more um, more leeway uh, because instead of casting flame blade or flame strike uh, they just have to pick a different a different damage type. Uh, when they first when they first select the spell, so instead of flame blade, a druid might cast lightning blade or frost blade, um, and I feel like that actually, uh, my players who have who have played divine casters have really seemed to enjoy it. Like almost, it just it's almost just lets them uh, customize it a little bit more than usual to the straight to their character. Um, Spell, yeah, spells like contact other plane or plane shift. Yeah, basically most of the, there's a list, but they mostly don't uh, just don't exist, or they just don't work very well. Like if you cast plane shift, I hope you want to go to the border ethereal because that's as far as it will take you. Um, I guess that's about it for divine magic. Yeah. Um, for arcane magic, uh, because, uh. Because the the core the core city states in the kingdom um, are ruled by sorcerers, uh, there's a lo long list of spells from the player's handbook uh, that have been added to the sorcerer spell list. Uh, just start it started out of necessity for like, oh god, identifies not a sorcerer spell; it's only a wizard spell. And then, well, with 900 years to think about it, sorcerers could probably figure out how to cast identify. So. Add it to the spell list. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so sorcerers will ha sorcerer characters will have an expanded spell list, um, and then I've created over over fifty new spells. Uh, definitely made sure that there will be something for everybody. Uh, sorcerers and wizards get a fair amount. Warlocks do, but there's there's ranger spells and paladin spells and druid spells. Uh, sort of. Plenty, plenty of love to go around. Like I didn't want to, didn't want to leave any, any one, any one class uh, in the lurch. Um, 
and then wizards while they work the same mechanically setting wise um they're they're usually problematic because these core lands that are ruled by sorceress bloodlines um over over all those centuries that passed uh basically did a smear job on wizards um so that uh, in those city those societies that are are uh descended from the Rasvin empire they 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 basically have a cultural taboo against wizardry mm -hmm. wizards have been blamed for the great frost and the second freeze and wizardry is a a dangerous unstable thing that can't be controlled um and one of the, and the main thing that they point to to back up that is that is uh, is necromancy like necromantic spells Sor sorcerers never have access to necromancy and wizards do mm -hmm. um and that's just something that that they use uh that that they use to to, to help uh to help scapegoat um there's I mean, there's a little bit more to it than that but um but that's meta plot and I, I i designed the meta plot to really almost be invisible a lot of the a lot of the time that there 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 are reasons for everything that's happened uh but that's in the background like if you're not interested in it your your adventures don't have to touch it your campaign doesn't even have to touch it um but if you, but if you want to delve into that then it's there mm -hmm. and that's one of the and that's one of the layers of a uh, mystery and exploration uh for for the setting yeah and when it um now with these with these sort of with these sort of setups um one there now given given the kind of setting that you're that you're dealing with here which i'd say i'd say i'd say has more in common with the colder parts of e of eastern Euro of eastern europe if nothing if nothing else um mm -hmm. where do, where where do you fit um things like mo things like monks into that since that's all that always ends up being an odd fit odd fit um you know i i haven't done a lot of work uh integrating the monks mm -hmm. uh only one or one or two players have have been monks and so i just let they've they've the first one created his own monastery that that he came from um yeah as much as i as much as i'd like to think that my setting isn't like steeped in in european culture i'm sure it absolutely is um because you know we're just never we don't we don't see our own biases um Certainly, uh, the naming conventions for everything from the Razvan Empire mm -hmm. uh, is is all Romanian or or adjacent to that Serbian Croatian. Um, I'm a really big tennis fan, and I was watching a lot. I was watching a lot of tennis around the time I started started it, uh, and I just I sort of liked the names, the, mm -hmm. the the first last names of some of the Romanian tennis players, and so I thought it would be. Uh, it would be interesting to to well, take it. Could, a, it could be worse. To, you could have gone. You could have gone with Polish names. <laughs> that would yeah. That would, that would have been interesting for uh, pronunciation and spelling reasons. Not to, um, not to pick not to pick on any Polish listeners, but let's be honest. That language is hard mode. Yep. Yep. Um. Yeah. Um. Yeah, you know, I just I I haven't made any uh, I haven't created any orders of monks that that are are larger than just like a, a small region like a small region. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't so I haven't developed them. I haven't really developed them as much. Uh, so yeah, that's an that's an oversight that uh, thankfully I will have some time to. Uh, address yeah. before the whole campaign set is out yeah, because yeah the the prop the problems inherent with um cultural appropriation uh 
they're they're challenging. They're challenging, and you want and you want it to be not less. You want it to be less appropriation and more inspired by. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a happy medium. Uh, there's a happy medium somewhere in the middle there. I do. Th I. I do think I do think it's I do think it's possible to be I think it's a lot easier than people um than people think it is to be done, um, but it's it's one of, it's one of those things where it where it would have to it would have to be grown from that from that partic from that particular um setting and given the, and given the way I I'd, I'd actually say you'd have an easier time than some than some settings would. Simply, simply because of the fact that you already have a, you already have a, a bit of a setup when it comes to the, when it comes to the divine end of the magical spectrum. Yeah, yeah, that they wouldn't necessarily have to be a religious order to, to want to this god or that god. Um, that they could just be spiritual without being completely dedicated uh, to a deity, and um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's it's it's challenging. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of a minefield uh, involved in in doing something. Of course, that, of course. At the end of the that, at the end of the day, people are people are going to create what what they're what they're going to create. Um, that's true, and they and they just want to know how. Like, mm -hmm. this is what I want to do. How can how can it fit into your campaign? Yeah. Um, um, for me, per, for me personally, if I, if if I was running based on how you've described fading embers so far, if I was running it myself. Um, the the approach that I would probably end up taking is to treat to treat monks as a um as an as an or, as a um order that f given the, given the whole um given given the re um religious aspect that's placed on um that's placed on fi on fire mm -hmm. and the way you said it the uh, world hearth um. You could pro you could probably you could probably make some sort some sort of order that focuses on the inter internal interpretation of it. Oh. Because well because well everybody ha every every hu every being has some sort of body heat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and 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 the the fire restrictions sort mm -hmm. of yeah, it, it it'll reach to it re, it'll reach to monks if somebody plays like a a, a monk of the four elements. Uh, if they want to take fire kihos, uh, they just they just have to make sure that their homeland is back Algera and not one of the other uh, and not one of the other places. Yeah. Um. And because of. With that, with that, with that kind, with that kind of thing in 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 mind. Um, now you you had hinted you had hinted about certain ma certain magic items, and to that end, I'm cur I'm curious. Um, what some what some of the what some of the new tricks that I, that could potentially be seen with um with ma with magic items in this setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have an idea? Um, sorry, do, do you have an example? Um, um, no. What I'm what I'm cur what I'm curious about is what some, what a few examples of magic items that you could that you could go into and do, do does the um, state of magic within the fading embers change how magic items work? Um, the only the only change is uh, for basically. F Magical items that are fire-based, uh, that their rarity level is incre is increased by at least one, by at least one rank, uh, so that it so that they're more so that they're just they're rarer, they're more difficult to make, um, and in game I mean out of out of game out of character or whatever, um, yeah, it's just you you don't if you if you 
made a snow and ice world, you don't want to flood it with with magical fire because it sort of takes the bite out of it. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and then in game, it's just that fu- that it's it's fire magic just takes uh it just takes more it just takes more effort more 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 magical control to make um and that's all tied up with with the world hearth and in the meta plot Mm -hmm. uh as well um yeah okay well let's see So, so you have the uh you've seen the setting primer yeah uh so Let's see. Uh, the am- Amulet of the Nameless mm-hmm. is a, a sort of a, a warlock, uh, a warlock item. Mm-hmm. That, that's them. Sorry. Uh, that <laughs> while while wearing this writhing uh, necklace, when you kill a sentient humanoid with a spell cast using a war. Warlock spell slot, uh, you may regain that warlock spell slot. I can only perform this function once, renewing it, renewing at sunset. Um, let's see. Oh, one thing. Yeah, one. So I was trying. I was trying to think about like what, what would be a good topic within magical items, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it it's it brings me back to the to the core the core lands where there's that magic using upper class um where you would just have to get involved with like okay say you're say you're a wealthy sorcerer um how do you secure your valuables your house you know it's probably some sort of alarm spell um that would be set up with something uh one item i made is a is a knock lock um that it's it's a enchanted lock that has it has just physically has two different like it's like a double padlock and only one of them is is closed at a time and uh when 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 it's activated if somebody casts a knock spell on it to unlock it uh in the act of unlocking it it will close the other lock on it so that so that really somebody will need two knock spells in order to get through it um and while player characters might not have a problem with that like your 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 average thief might not have two second level spell slots. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so coming up with like, all right, well, like what you know, if you made like a mage thief, uh, like what what sort of what sort of awesome stuff could they do to burglarize a place? Uh, you know, and and then looking at it from the other side of like, all right, knowing that there are magic using thieves out there, what sort of items are you going to create? that will make it difficult for them to steal all of your stuff. Um, and then the step past that is law enforcement. What sort of things are you going to need to deal with magic thieves? Um, and one of those is the the compass of the watch and the setting primer uh, that's used to help guards cope with magic using criminals. Um, you just sort of mentally tag a target you can see within 100 feet. And for the next hour, the compass will point you towards them as mm-hmm. long as they're within 500 feet of you, so yeah. that you could so that you could have this interesting chase scene through th- through a city. Um, but if you cast Dimension Door, I don't remember if that's 400 feet or 500 feet. Like like the the smart the smart thieves who who know their stuff. Uh, can always can always find find ways out of it, little loopholes. Yeah, but that but that but that's been an interesting mental ex- exercise to go back and forth with. Mm-hmm. Just like what would what what would happen, like what what would cause an effect, uh, create between between law enforcement and thieves. Um, past that, there's not really. Like there's, there's not really more more interesting storylines um, about the magical items. Uh, I just tried to do a little bit of everything. Uh, my partner Kelsey was was very fervent that we must have over a hundred magical items, uh, and so some are mo- some are more serious, some are a little bit more playful. Um, 
one of one of uh, my favorite playful ones uh, is an actual portable hole. Uh, is is what it's called. It's called actual portable hole. So instead of being a bag of holding, it's more like uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit cartoons. Like it's a big black dot that you put on something, and then you can go through, then you can go through that something. Uh, something that that players I think have been asking for 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 a long time. Uh, I know my players certainly have. All um, it's certainly it's certainly an, it's certainly a nice touch. Although, per, although personally, I um, I do not. I had a bit of a experience when so, when somebody tr- when somebody tried the. Um, and somebody tried to do the whole arrow of total destruction experiment. Um, basically, mm-hmm. by creating a divide by zero moment using... What would happen if you put a bag of holding inside of a portable hole? Okay. And the, re- the result was a, mini- was a temporary mini black hole. Yeah, I think the DMG... D- does have rules yeah. for I don't know if I don't remember if they're the same now for yeah it's, which, it's become for, for, for it's, which goes inside of which it's one of those things that's become a meme about why engineers shouldn't play d and d because <laughs> <laughs> because the arrow of total destruction has this whole diagram about how about how it would work um, <laughs> yeah possible to bring a little bit a little bit too much uh mm-hmm. science and logic into a game with magic items. <laughs> and when it com- and when it comes to th- when it comes to that um like I, I know that I know that you had put three adv- three adventures within the um, primer but I'm cur- I'm curious if you've if there'll be any um for any further if you have like a full um, adventure path set up for fading embers, um, I I do have a module that would pro that once the the campaign set is mm-hmm. is totally is totally out and and up on drive through RPG and everything. Um, I do have a module uh, that would definitely be my next project um, that's based in a in just a a town in in neutral in neutral lands um, that's based around the Fae. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a lot of fun to create, uh, and definitely modeled on like a MMO. Like here's a quest hub, and there's a quest hub, um, and lots of there's lots lots of things are connected to to lots of other things in it, um, and that'll be that'll be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that, and then thinking about. Maybe maybe coming up with a second one, and to ha- to have to do a Kickstarter with with these two little campaign uh, modules. Mm-hmm. Um, the Fay are something that I I think is just like a bottomless bottomless well of inspiration uh, for for role playing games for D anD D, and especially uh, especially since I've cut off the outer planes uh, from from <laughs> from Nith. Uh you know, there's no without demons and angels and and devils. Um, I've really focused on like three different three different categories of monsters that really get the spotlight uh, in Fading Embers, and the Fey are one of them. Uh, where they've been like th- they were stranded on Nith when the Great Frost happened and the gods went away and everything. Um, and so there's not really a Fey Wild, but there's these little broken pieces of the fey of the fey wild that i uh, they're they're called fey pockets um and and that's where the fey sort of sort of congregate uh and those fey pockets are usually close to 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 where mortals live because the fey have always the fey always just, they need they need to interact with mortals whether they need it for inspiration or an audience or substance sustenance sometimes um so there's so much you can do with them uh, and then uh, lycanthropes is the second one because you just sort of see like a 
a, a little bit of an advantage just from a survival uh, from a survival standpoint to be covered in to be covered in fur. Um, just a bit when it's when it's cold outside, um, and then all of the problems that that creates. And I changed. Uh, I tweaked lycanthropy in fading embers so that rather than just the full moon, uh, it's whatever whatever phase of the moon you were infected under. That phase of the moon is the one that will is the one that will will trigger you, um, and the reason for that is so that so that lycanthropes are a constant threat. Instead, like, instead of just hey, it's a full moon out. Everybody, everybody, run gra and grab your silver bullets. Yep, ex exactly. So there's just nope on any on any given night, there can be lycanthropes out mm -hmm. there, um, and even like true lycanthropes can sort of almost charm or dominate infected lycanthropes sometimes and the more powerful true lycanthropes could even could even trigger a transformation from an infected person just to really to really just sort of up the up the, the danger level and the threat level yeah um and then the third uh the third category is aberrations mm -hmm. um and they're they're very heavily lovecraft inspired aberrations yeah um, now I did see the short list of uh, of um of monster types that are rare or ex or extinct that you put in the uh, yep. um, primer called R.I.P. Monsters. Now, obviously, it's tip it's hard to do a um a exhaustive list of the of ones that would be ones that would be rare or possibly off the table. But yeah, what's for for those who are con who are considering putting in monsters from uh, from third party books like the recently released cre um or recently kickstarted creatures book that um, oh yeah that um Jade Opal is doing um what would be your baseline as far as what sort what sort of monsters would be off the table um off the table would generally be things that are are innately very, very fire oriented, or very just that like something that if it's if it's just like no that could that could never survive in a frozen land. Uh, I don't know fire giants, hellhounds, lizard folk mm -hmm. tend to be in like swampy, warmer places. Um, you know, it's hard to as, as a game master, it's hard to say like it's off the table, but like they would be la largely extinct. Any anything that would would thrive in a, in a in a in a hot desert environment would be extremely rare, if not extinct. Um, and anything that comes directly from the outer plains um, w would be the same. Would be would be the same way. Like there there might be some like there might there might be some demons and devils left. Um, on Nith, uh, but only if they've been if they've been there for the last nine centuries, mm -hmm. um, and so they're just sort of biding their time, hoping to hoping to get back out. Um, that's really that's really the, the the main thing is just outer planar and fire oriented, um, and sometimes you you get really interesting ones like the uh, the Remor has from the Monster Manual. That is like a cold weather creature, but it's but like it, internally it's it's fire and heat oriented. Um, but but again, they they just provide their own heat source <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and thrive very well in uh, in Arctic situations and even in the water. I think they they can they could be used in interesting ways. Yeah, and when. Um... Now I know you're. I know you're setting up for three books. Um, I realize that everything's in flux right now, but what would your estimate be for the page count for those three books? Oh, all right. Uh, do, do, do. All right. Um, right now, the player's manual uh, is estimated at 170 pages. Mm -hmm. The game master's manual is at 190, and the setting manual at 85. 
So uh, 445 pages between all three of them uh, at, at current estimate, sort of, mm -hmm. sort of rounding up. Uh, yeah, so it's a substantial amount. It's a, it's a lot of material. Mm -hmm. People, people will absolutely get their money's worth from me. Yeah, and now you're cur now you're currently at about at just a, just um, a little a little over halfway at the at the time of this recording. Um, yep. Now, oh, yep. now just just ticked mm -hmm. up. Fifty-seven percent just broke the eight thousand mark. So, first, off, so first off, let me knock on wood for the next question. <laughs> um, now, presume now, presuming everything goes as planned, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Are you thinking, um, like a little a little ways into twenty twenty one? Um, de definitely, it would take longer. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the the whole reason that I that I ha that I have to use crowdfunding to do this is to raise money for artwork. So I need money to pay the artists. Um, there are, are chaos campaigns running all of October 2020. Uh, so it takes mm, it takes about two and a half weeks, or at least that's how long it took the first time for me. Mm -hmm. it took about two and a half weeks uh, for Kickstarter to to transfer the money into my account. Um, and then that's right before Thanksgiving. Uh, you know, fa factor in the holidays. Artists have holidays too. <laughs> um, so I I'm sure I'm sure some of the artists will be able to to start working almost immediately. Um, but some of them aren't. You know, some of them might have to wait a month or two. Um, so I'm I'm estimating that uh, that I can do delivery on all of it. By August, uh, I think on the on the on the campaign for the PDFs was thinking June of twenty one, um, and then for for the print versions, uh, two for about two months after that, so August twenty twenty one. Doing layout for probably it will just be the same layout uh, for each, just swapping out. Uh, Swapping out some of the artwork uh, for to, to have the the color the CMYK color, which is better for printing than digital, mm -hmm. um, and then it, and then even even if it was went really simply, uh, I still have to uh, drive through RPGs print on demand uh, before it can before before it can can be made public. Uh, I have to order a copy of it and it has to, you know and wait for it wait for it to be made wait for it to be shipped to me. And then I check it out and give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down and go back to another revision. And if there's a revision, got to be printed, got to ship to me. <laughs> um, so just sort of trying to trying to build in enough time that I that I think I can make the deadline that I'm setting. I'd, I'd yeah. rather I'd rather everything uh, I'd rather estimate a long time and then be able to get it to people faster than promised. Then then I, I would hate to I would hate to end up being late and making make people wait, make people worry. Mm -hmm. Well, it's 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 always better to be early than late. Absolutely. And I know I know some people try and do the whole a wizard is never late. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> you're not a wizard. <laughs> this is true. Um, I can't I can't even grow that much of a beard. I could. I just. I, I like I like to keep it trimmed. Yeah. Um, but regardless, I'll be I'll be keeping an eye out on the development of Fading Embers and what co and what comes next. Um. And with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to enjoy the madness <laughs> that play here that play here in the temple. My um, pleasure. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> we, all, we, all, we all need something during a pandemic. Yeah. And of course, a sincere thanks go out to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the show. And there will be more insanity where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. 
But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!